Uh, good morning. Uh, we're a few minutes late. Uh, we don't have much time, but we don't have much of a group here either. <laughs> um, the purpose of this meeting is to frame the discussion about consensus regarding the procedures themselves. So I think there are a number of issues uh, that relate to preoperative assessment. Uh, as as the, the treating physician, what we need. Um, then there's uh, the procedure itself, the access, the uh, medications used, uh, the types of balloons, the various techniques. And then there's uh, uh, assessment of uh, coming to some resolution about measures of success, what was an appropriate endpoint, um, what tools we use, etc. What anticoagulation we used before, during, and after the procedure, etc. So, uh, in preparation for that, I started. I sent out a survey to about uh, 80, 83. I mean, up to about 82, 83 page, uh, people who were told. I believed did the procedure. I believe that this is um, a reasonable representation. Although I think we can continue the survey. Uh, so. Um, maybe I can show the list of names and if anybody has some suggestions of additional physicians who perform procedures that we could survey, we can come to a more defined consensus. Um, the purpose of the survey was to find areas of agreement and disagreement, so we didn't spend much time on those uh, topics. So I'm going to review the survey um, and then we'll have, start having a discussion. Uh, Dr. Simka has had a couple of meetings, I think, in uh, Europe and uh, tried to derive some uh, general framework for um, a consensus. But I think uh, we, you know, we have to review that as well. Okay, so I had 59 uh, responses. Uh, 58 um, actually performed the procedure. There was one, uh, three people who didn't perform the procedure at all. So they, they were, the survey stopped with them right there. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people were male. And uh, the average age is about 50 years old. And um, um, you can see here that the overwhelming majority of people who performed this procedure, at least among those I surveyed, were interventional radiologists diagnostic radiologists who performed interventional radiology and uh, neurointerventionalists. And there was a smattering of 10% uh, surgeons and a, um, one cardiologist. I believe that that's a deficiency in the survey, that we need to get more uh, names. Uh, Marion, is it not true that in Europe uh, there are more cardiologists and surgeons doing this procedure? Um, than interventional radiology? It depends on the country because, you know, there are different regulations uh, in uh, some countries. Only vascular surgeons are allowed to, to do these procedures, uh, while the, the other interventional cardiologists are prevailing. It's very specific in each, every country. So it's very different. Okay. We have representatives here from uh, Italy, and Poland, from Europe. I think anybody else? Oh, Slovenia, sorry. Uh, so, and here we have uh, a few Americans. Okay, so if, we'll, if we could get the names of anybody with their email that you know that, that is performing the procedure, we can send them the survey as well. Um, I'm going to skip these. The average person graduated from uh, medical school about 12 years, 13 years ago, and uh, about 10 years ago finished their fellowship. Uh, most of the practices were in the United States and uh, a little bit less in Europe, but that may be sur sampling uh, error. Uh, there was one person in the Middle East and uh, one person from, from India. But you can see the majority that we captured were from Europe and the United States. Uh, I'll skip this question. Um, the group was divided relatively evenly between private practice and academic practice. And the majority of people were in a group practice 
uh, with about half being the only person in their group that performed the procedure and the other half having multiple uh, operators uh, within the group. Most, uh, half the people were in hospital practice and then there's a smattering through uh, a whole variety of uh, different types of situations. It's interestingly that about 40 percent do not practice under IRB uh, oversight. Um, and some had registry, uh, there were a few trials, uh, and there were a number of people who had some patients treated under IRB study and others that were not. The training by most of the people performing this procedure, as one would expect, is self-teaching in the sense that there are no real courses to speak of, uh, there are no places to go uh, and have formalized training uh, at this point. Uh, so most people learned on their own and supplemented that with uh, some conferences. Uh, I found this interesting that 26 percent actually had formal privileges uh, in their hospital to perform this procedure. Um, I never, I didn't have that. The majority of people started performing the procedure in 2010. And the average person uh, performed about 250 procedures. And I, I don't have those details here, but I've gone into it and looked at it. Uh, it's interesting to see that the, almost the majority of uh, the physicians treated nobody from their own city. And the majority saw most of the patients from their own country. And when they treated patients from outside their own country, uh, there was pretty evenly divided, be uh, pretty much the most common was the North America. The North American patients moved to other countries to have the procedure done. Presumably that's a lot of Canadians going around the world. The, somewhere between, uh, let's see, it's about 65% of the patients were self, or 65% of the treating physicians had uh, most of the patients self-referred. I thought that was interesting. There are very few people um, uh, referred by medical travel organizations, for example, which, which was has been described as one of the ways we, uh, we, we reach our patients. So it doesn't seem like that's truly the case. Uh, of note, quite a number of patients, 75% uh, of the physicians had less than 10% of their patients referred by another doctor. And uh, some had no, uh, you know, that almost no involvement by neurologists. The initial contacts were relatively divided by a clerical in contact or a physician and a third web methodology for reaching the patient and having the first interaction was an electronic uh, mechanism. I, I think we have to cone in on this question because I don't understand the answers really. Uh, only 68 percent did a neurological examination, but it's unclear whether 68 percent of the physicians did their own neurological exam or relied on someone else's neurological exam for uh, their assessment. And, you know, less than two-thirds actually did a, a limited heart and lung examination. It's a little surprising. Um, and Two people had no assessment before performing the procedure. Pretty scary. Um, this was, I think, where we have uh, some contention in the preoperative assessment. There are a wide variation in the tools used to assess patients. 
for example, 25% use a non-standardized physician-generated questionnaire of no validity. Uh, it may be helpful, but uh, very few people use many of the standard neurological testing tools as part of their assessment, yet a fair majority of the people were in universities or, or working under an IRB uh, protocol. So it's kind of surprising here. I think we probably need to work this out more to get a better sense of it. Um, I don't think there's consensus based on this survey about how to, to assess the patient. Uh, s similarly, the preoperative imaging uh, was predominantly done by Doppler, and I think we could work on a survey to get deeper into how they use the survey. I mean, I didn't get into that detail on this first go-round. Um, very few people use the functional MR or MRV. Um, the lab testing is interesting that only 43% use a pregnancy test on women of childbearing age. Um, and not everybody checked blood chemistries. It's pretty interesting. Uh, this is pretty disturbing to me. More than 25% of people did not wash their hands or scrub their hands. Um, and the majority of people used a fixed mounted uh, angiography unit. Uh, not surprising that that would happen in the hospital. Uh, and in non-hospital setting, it's probably where these people are using C-arms. Uh, we had better consensus, but it seems to be that uh, hand injections um, were used uh, by the majority of people, and few people used power injectors for this examination. 50% um, of people had no IVUS, and Few people use them with a routine, in routine basis, uh, and some use it occasionally, and some didn't use it at all. Uh, kind of surprising. And most, I don't think they understood this question here of what a cine, uh, you know, cine versus serial films, I think was probably unclear in the survey, and we probably could look at that some more. Uh, the majority of people use the right femoral access for the procedure. few used left, left side. And uh, ultrasound was used um, always in 20% and occasionally used in uh, the near majority. Uh, everybody used a sheath, so that we have, one, we have consensus, I think, in the use of a sheath, so, but most use a short sheath. Um, I know I use a long sheath because when I use IVUS, the wire is so so small and thin that it frequently buckles into the heart and can cause trouble. So that's why I use a long sheath. But, um, now, two-thirds of the use anticoagulation during the procedure. Now, it's a busy slide here, but what you can see is that the question asked is what Im what what blood vessels do you study? And we certainly have consensus on right and left jugular veins, the uh, azagous arch, but not all people uh, perform assessment of the ascending azagous vein. I don't know if that's um, a verbal confusion or means that they're just looking at the upper azagous vein, not looking at the lower part, the junction of the azagous and hemiazagous, etc. And there was very little consensus um, beyond that. I mean, I guess brachiocephalic veins were uh, studied more frequently than the, uh, the renal veins or the ascending lumbar vein. Yet Paolo never reported the use, the study of those veins. Uh, kind of surprising. Uh, we don't have consensus on the, the use, uh, the imaging of the dural sinuses. And we could cone down on this question, I think, but 
35% uh, believe that a stenosis of 25% is an appropriate uh, indication for the procedure, um, but only 70% think a 50 to 70% stenosis is an indication. So we, this is a, this part here is, I guess, up for discussion. If you take this, these three, we don't have consensus really on the treatments. We have, we're trending towards consensus, but I, I think we have to get a better consensus uh, about this, and I'm not sure we have the evidence to, to make a consensus report on that. Um, and then you can see all the others. Uh, it's interesting that things like duplication, septum, membranes, and webs, and valve immobility are uh, so high, yet most people don't use IVUS, which is really the way to evaluate those things. We had pretty good consensus on uh, non-compliant high-pressure balloons. Um, a few people use cutting balloons or kissing balloons, but surprisingly, 12 people use compliant balloons. And uh, you know, my own assessment is that the average pressure necessary to open up the vein, the balloon completely, is uh, about 14 atmospheres. So uh, I really need to probably come up with a better question than this one to understand it better. Um, I'm not going to go through this. It's, this, was, this question was, how do you determine what size balloon to use? It's all over the place. Um, and I, I don't think there's any consensus on how you determine what balloon size to use. Um, and the endpoints, uh, improved flow is the best, uh, the most, the came closest to consensus. And, and uh, elimination of stenosis, um, absence of stasis, but uh, full inflation of the balloon with no pressure drop was not used very frequently. Uh, testing for elastic recoil wasn't used that success, uh, frequently. I don't think we have consensus on that one. Uh, which endpoint do you believe is the most reliable? We have no consensus on the most reliable uh, assessment. The, the best we come up with is 40% uh, for improved flow, which is so subjective that I think we have an area of uh, um, of analysis to do. Um, we had no consensus, as far as I can see, on anticoagulation uh, after angioplasty. And this question on the uh, use of stents um, was pretty evenly divided. I don't know if we have consensus on any, we have pretty much negative consensus on most use of stents. That's how I would interpret this. So uh, you wouldn't use stents if you recanalize a vein. Um, you wouldn't use stents uh, for extrinsic compression of the jugular azicus vein. And you wouldn't use stent for the nutcracker or uh, May Turner syndrome. Oh, you would use it for those, sorry. Sorry. But not for the internal jugular. And so I think we have negative consensus on, or limited, we have consensus on limited uh, use of stents, is what I would interpret that as. Um, and self-expanding stents were the one that, was, we have pretty much consensus on that. Um, and we have no consensus on anticoagulation after treatment with a stent. And we have, cons you know, the consensus is that the majority of uh, people believe that both the interventionalist and the referring physician should follow the patient. But from the beginning of the survey, we learned that most patients are self-referred. So we have, you know, we have an idealized situation uh, here, but I should have asked the question: of Who follows your patients after you've treated them? And I wonder whether, you know, this would be, you know, I don't know what where they sit here. It sounds looks like the vast majority of the interventionalists are following their patients. 
by that. And um, follow-up schedule, it looks like the majority think that every three months is a reasonable follow-up. Um, and a lot of people want to do a follow-up at one month as well. And five people thought a routine follow-up was not necessary at all. And that's the survey. Anybody have any comments about the survey or um, recommendations for improving the survey? Anybody? No? OK, so, uh, so my suggestion uh, would be to send this survey with results, total results, again to the responders. Again? Again. And perhaps this so-called Delphi approach. And perhaps we'll get, uh, because now we have what is the reality. Uh, but uh, if people get uh, some opinion of, of the others, perhaps they will change their minds or, or so. So perhaps we'll be closer to, to some kind of, uh, of consensus. Or, so you're saying or, or, send out the results of the survey and, and then send out the survey yes. again. Any comments? Is it? It's a common practice in, in, in obtaining some, some kind of uh, consensus in medicine. Okay. It, it, you have a goal in between, though. I mean, this is the, the first thing that you did, Sal, um, and I applaud the effort in getting even this much response, which is pretty notable for, for surveys, to try to get a sense of what's out there. And now we're talking about whether this, the questions accurately represented people's opinions. But what you're talking about is reaching consensus around specific questions and returning information that people answered is not the basis for that. The basis for the Delphi round is here are points about which we can or can't agree mm. and then reaching that. So this data doesn't go back to people for Delphi. We have to formulate questions such as should we recommend that the X be done? You know, that there should be a maximum oversizing of X versus Y. Can a group of people that have been either self-designated or otherwise agree that this is an expert, you know, that we have at least level three recommendations? And that would go to Delphi. So we're, I think we're two steps away from that, though. I understand what you're saying. Anybody, anybody, any other thoughts? Okay, so. But I, but I think that that's a good goal, and maybe the goal should be to come up with maybe five, six, ten, whatever the number is of suggested points around which you could use this group and see whether this is a useful Delphi group or not. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, usually when you do that, you try to identify the expertise of the people who are responding as well, and maybe you want to stratify them by the number of cases that they've done or by some other criteria that says that. You know, it's not fly by night, but you know, this is a bank of experience right. and therefore experts. Right. Okay. Well, uh, Marion's done another piece of work. So before we get into the, the detail, is there anything that we didn't review here that's in your document? Any components that we didn't that we left out? I don't see, but this document deals mostly with uh, technique of vinography. There's only a few uh, suggestions regarding uh, procedure by, by, by itself. A procedure by itself. Uh, but uh, but this, this document, which uh, was distributed to you, is, uh, deals mostly with uh, diagnostic part of the procedure. Okay, so I think we should start with uh, Let's work our way through a patient and have some conversation, um, see where we can go with that. Um, see, those are really good ideas. Uh, we can work on the survey, but I think we'll come back to the survey maybe uh, later on. Um, it was really pretty good. I mean, it was sent out uh, eight days later, a second was sent out, and uh, two, three days before the, and we, it was sent out again. In fact, sometime there was a glitch in it, it was sent out twice to the, each of the emails was sent out twice, so I had to keep people from answering it more than once, actually, <laughs> which I think was pretty good. I don't think that, that happened. Well, let's talk about the preoperative assessment for a moment. Okay, so uh, this document was created step by, by step. Uh, first, the version was, uh, was done in er early November, as I remember, so I sent it to 
many doctors from uh, many countries with some response. Uh, then this document was was uh, changed, uh, and now you have this version <laughs> from the last week. Uh, uh, Perhaps you, uh, you've uh, already uh, read something on the, of, this, of this, if not, please uh, look at the details. Mm, in general, there is a no, not a consensus document. Uh, there is a description uh, of the point where we are now, and unfortunately, uh, we don't know how to, to do venography in internal jugal veins, uh, as angles, Wait, and Mary, the others, others do veins. Do we have copies of it? We have members of the audience looking for Yes? Forward. Please take. Marion, before you go to that, let's, let's start at preoperative assessment. We, we really need to have a consensus on what constitutes the, you know, the minimum necessary preoperative assessment. I don't think we should start with a venography at this point, um, and you don't have the, so let's just start there. I mean, we should start before the patient, then the treatment, uh, then the diagnosis, then the treatment, then the post-operative care. I don't think um, we're really ready for this yet. So, is there any uh, comments about preoperative assessment? <laughs> so we don't need any preoperative assessment. Come on. Uh, I think we need formal conventional validation of the diagnosis by the same criteria that anyone else uses. We should naturally be asking for that. We should abjure the kind of thing that says that because somebody says they have, then I mean, that doesn't stand for anything, right? As physicians, we validate. So we should insist on having some demonstrated criteria, even if it's medical records from the outside. You don't have to be right. the same clinician. So that's part of pre-op assessment, right? And then. There are sessions adjacent to us to talk about screening with the question marks about what is the best or not, you know, locally validated. But we agree on those things. Well, let me let me play the devil's advocate. Um, in my in my in my uh, practice, the incidence of uh, venous abnormality on venography and IVIS is about 98 percent. So, do we need a preoperative imaging assessment at all? What's the point if 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 you have multiple sclerosis, you have a 98% chance of having some abnormality on a venogram. First of all, I think we have to, are we treating MS? No, we're or talking about CCSVI. Right. So what are the non-invasive criteria for establishing a diagnosis of CCSVI? I think basic, based on some of the conversations that were going on yesterday about multimodality and uh, different criteria on MR and ultrasound, is the diagnosis non-invasively of CCSVI going to be established with MR and ultrasound, just ultrasound? I think that needs to be firmly established. I asked Robert that question yesterday based upon his evaluation of the literature. What is it on MR that is pathognomonic for this that's going to give us a diagnosis? Or what are the you know, Zamboni obviously, Dr. Zamboni obviously has his criteria about ultrasound. Is that what we're going to follow? I think that's the question that has to be answered. Because I, I don't think it is fair to say you have to do an invasive test to establish um, a diagnosis of CCSVI. That may be true. You could be right. But I do think that there, based upon what, what has been discussed thus far, there are non-invasive uh, mm -hmm. criteria that could be developed. Uh, I totally agree. I, 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 my opinion is that at this moment uh, we are not allowed to do invasive tests without not invasive tests. Perhaps in the future it will be proven that the, the, the sonography is not necessary, but uh, for the time being I, I think it's, it, it should be done. At least for the, for, for the reason of safety of the patient. You know, regarding the protocol of sonography, I, I think we will not, uh, not solve this problem, which protocol is, is the best one. Anyway, uh, in my opinion, personal opinion, sonography is an integral part of the pre-procedure uh, evaluation of the patient, as well as a magnetic resonance venography, 
also in the opinion of our team, because of course this um, abnormalities uh, which are very difficult to diagnose by means of ultrasound but are clearly visible with uh, uh, magnetic resonance venography, of course they are not very often but, but uh, they are. What are going to be those things on the menu that have to be checked in order at the bottom of it to come out as CCSVI? That's what I think needs to be done in a pre-op assessment. Well, you know, I, yes. We create in our country a team of neurologists, cardiologists, and radiologists. So uh, our patient arrive in a team, and uh, we make a certain uh, cardiologist um, follow-up and neurological follow-up and ultrasound investigation. According to all this investigation, then we sit down with uh, our invasive radiologist to go through all the documentation and then to decide to go to the procedure. Uh, we found out um, in um, a quite um, a lot of number, more than 50%, some cardiological problem or other diseases. And you need to calculate for the patient, is this safe to go to the procedure or not? But from our experience, we found out that it's necessary to make a ultrasound before procedure and also magnetic resonance imaging of the brain to prove the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So okay. that's, that's our vision, to treat the combine the patient as a human being and to take into account all the diseases and all the danger. Right. For example, uh, if uh, we, ne we need to check uh, all the tests, blood tests, we need to check kidney also, kidney function and all these things to avoid uh, complication. Uh, according to the procedure. So. Michael? Yeah. Well, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I think our group is looking at catheter, venography, and IVA. So I think we are never going to come to the, this first answer. We'd get bogged down here on the pre procedure diagnosis. I think what we need to obviously say is there's an established diagnosis of CCSVI by non invasive imaging criteria or not, you know, and the non-invasive imaging criteria may be locally dependent, regionally, whatever. We are not, the, our group will never get through to the actual meat of what we're after. I think we just need to say there has to be, and I would prefer, I feel most comfortable with a non-invasive diagnosis prior to, I think we could all kind of come to a consensus on that. I'm not disputing what you say, but since we've agreed that CCSVI is what we're after. I think the first step would be a non-invasive, whether it's multimodality, whether it's ultrasound. We're never, I, we can't, that's going to be hard for us to, there are other groups that are kind of talking about that okay. now, I guess. So we, we that agree that, that... Does that make sense or not? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think as proceduralists, uh, we should have some, we have to make, we ultimately have to make the decision, right? So, you know, the imagers in the other room could say this is what you need to uh, come to a diagnosis of CCSVI, but I don't know if we have to uh, really. Let me offer the middle ground so perhaps we can get to the next part that you're talking about, which is the ideal goal is that there is a non-invasive imaging, right? That we know that it's cancer before we're going to operate on it. Same type of thing here. Whether we're there or not, we can probably reach a consensus statement that says, we agree that ideally a non-invasive validate measure will be right, used, right, okay. okay? And we open with that, let's go to the venography part, like Dr. Dake said. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so, all right. Now we talk about diagnose, the diagnostic angiograms. Oh, sorry. 
My name is Ciro Gargano, I'm from Italy. I'm an international radiologist, as you all, I think. Um, regarding ultrasound before uh, intervention, I think it's uh, always a good idea to perform a, a, a vascular Doppler, because sometimes uh, you can see lesions on Doppler that you can't see on the flibrography. And uh, I mean, it's usually, for example, in the, on the J2 um, piece of the jugular vein, it has happened to me a couple of times, and I described it uh, last year at the, uh, the same convention in Bologna, uh, where you can see stenosis on ultrasound, but you can't probably with the venography. Then I think it's safe, it's quick. Uh, why don't do uh, ultrasound? I think we always should do ultrasound before, even after. I do after the procedure always the Doppler, even if the uh, the flow doesn't change much after the procedure. But sometimes it's quick, it's easy. Uh, I can you, do that. You're doing it in the room before the. The t uh, patient leaves the room? Usually I study all the patients by myself with the Doppler before the intervention, but because I have got the machine and I can do Doppler. Uh, but if, I, if I've got a patient which I don't know, uh, sometimes it's a good idea to just perform a quick scan of the jugular vein. You, you, get, you get much information on, on that, and it takes only five minutes before, when the patient is on the, on the table, you just perform a quick scan and you realize uh, okay, the left has got a valve, even if you read it, but sometimes looking at uh, the jugular vein, for me at least, helps a lot. I, I'm, I, I agree with you, whether you do a CCSVI procedure or not, I think an ultrasound uh, can save you an hour worth of uh, fluoro that's time it. trying to get a catheter into a vessel that's, that's uh, occluded. And you know, you could easily miss the, an occlusion clinically. And even the femoral vein, sometimes it, happen, it has happened that you have got a bilateral uh, femoral vein occlusion. Because these people are people that have got, for example, 20 years of disease and they've been in bed without any anticoagulation for 20 years. It's not uncommon to find bilateral uh, fem um, femoral iliac um, obstruction completely. In that case, I mean, it's really tough. I mean, you can't go on the femoral vein. You need to change, or I direct puncture, or something else. But it takes just five minutes. Not to everybody, but right. at least people who are, you see, you're right. Well, can we have a show of hands? I mean, I, I've done about 300 procedures, and I have one femoral occlusion. Yeah. Two. Two, how many patients? Okay. Anybody else? Mary, you have the yeah, there were, there were not, not many, but there, there were such patients. No. But you know, even one is a problem. I've had more jugular vein occlusions than femoral. Yeah. Going from where? From the jugular. But you're not seeing the whole femoral, unfortunately not seeing the jugular vein. You're not seeing the upper jugular vein if you puncture the jugular vein, that's the problem. Right, okay. So we have agreement that uh, we, that we're going to need some diagnostic test to diagnose the, um, venous abnormalities in the neck. Is that, is that what Mike is suggesting? Sorry? As long as the false negative rate is accepted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm Milosevic from Slovenia. I'm international uh, neuroradiologist. I always think that, that we absolutely need ultrasound because also because of follow up, uh, for follow up of this patient. And maybe it could be also stated that this follow up should, should be performed by the same operator. Or I don't know because, but ultrasound. You believe it's ultrasound? Also because of the follow-up. You're saying ultrasound should be done because it's practical for follow-up. Is that right? Is yeah. that what you mean? Okay. Okay. Now, I was I, I was suggesting to, to move into the venography and I was issues, not go into the, the sonography. The sonography is discussed in the, the, the other room. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's skip to the, our main topic. Okay. 
So everybody agree that uh, femoral access, that, that we can agree on? As a primary femoral access? Okay. And uh, the sheath, everybody agree that sheath? Well, that, that would probably depend on uh, whether we agree that uh, ascending lumbar uh, venography is uh, and iliac venography are appropriate. So let's, let's just say femoral for now and you, you know, whether you believe that or not, you know, we'll come to that later. If you, if you believe that the, I don't think it matters as long as you can have an access that will get us what we need. So the, this problem is discussed in this, in this uh, draft. The problem is that maybe uh, more extensive examination is better uh, for the patient uh, because you know, for uh, many different veins, but for the price of higher dose of contrast, higher irradiation, higher risk of potential uh, complications. So uh, at the moment, uh, we are not sure if this risk is worth its price. Maybe yes, maybe not, but at the moment we, uh, evidence is lacking. So for sure some doctors opt for more extensive examination of all potential veins or many of these veins are the uh, focus on this on the Jaguar and, and as I go. Who is right, who is not? I we don't know. know. I I, yeah. I have to do it with uh, ultrasound. Uh, I started that because I had a patient come from elsewhere for a second procedure and the femoral vein was thrombosed and no one knew about it in advance. So I said, you know, it's just as easy to go with the saphenous vein and I'm not putting this femoral vein at risk. Anyway, <coughs> I don't think, I think that's a personal decision, right? Um, but I mean, we have, uh, we have the seminal paper that recommended uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, iliac venography, ascending lumbar venography, and uh, renal venography. You know, your group doesn't do it. The majority of people don't do it. So I think we could say at the minimum, <coughs> we should do both femoral, uh, uh, both jugular, uh, internal jugular veins and uh, azagous veins in its entirety, at least, uh, to the diaphragm. Do you agree with that? <coughs> we didn't have consensus, uh, full consensus on that. There are people that did not study the, these, the ascending azagous vein. Uh, can we, with, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, can we say that we should see the whole azagous vein? I think there was misunderstanding in your survey. Okay. Correct. Everybody agree with that? What about the whole, uh, the whole jugular vein? What's the end point for the catheterization to capture information on the entire jugular vein? Because there's a, you can have an enlarged ascending, uh, a, a, a large uh, pharyngeal vein that looks like a jugular vein. So how do you differentiate the so I would argue that, that we need to at least advance the guide wire into the sigmoid sinus to be sure that we've captured and visualized the entire jugular vein. Any comment? Okay, but in such a case, if you found a potential narrow in stenosis or whatever we we'll say it, at the level of uh, jugular foramen, what to do next? Well, is this is a, is a, is a important question, I, I think. Uh, should we manage uh, the solutions in, at this, this level? Because we've learned that, that there is a lot of complications after uh, angioplasty or, or stenting in, at this level. The, the question is, the, the question on of the course, table the question is, is should open. we look at the entire jugular vein or not? Can we just get a yes or no on that? No, that's all. Yes or no? 
I mean, whether we do something about it is a separate question. Mm -hmm. But what the problem is, uh, should we go with catheter above the, the Jaguar foramen? Or, ju or just inject contrast uh, from below it? Yes. I, I if the question here is where are you going to do the injection? Mm -hmm. where, where are you going to place the catheter to do the injection? That's the question, correct? I, I think that's the question, but I don't think we're going to be able to dogmatically do that. I think all the best we can say is we need to evaluate the jugular vein and leave it to operator dependence on where that catheter is. No, but if you look at a lot of the studies that people have done, the, the catheter is put in the middle of J2, and they get a venogram of J2 and J1, and they don't even get a venogram of J3. Except, okay. That's no. concern. That's, that's so we agree that we need the entirety of the jugular vein. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's, maybe we take it as a show of hands. Do we all agree that the entirety of the jugular vein, we talk about the technique to image in a second, needs to be imaged? Everybody yeah. hands up or not voting? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got majority there. Right. Um, yeah. How about the... Go ahead, Mike. No. I think, I think, see, we got to start with this high level, and then where do we have, that we get out of our comfort zone about being able to really say we don't have, we do have consensus. But clearly, I think everyone agrees we need to see the whole entire judgment. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. And, I mean, there's a number of ways to do that. Right? There are a number of ways to do that, that's right. Right? They, it could be done by uh, MR. It could be done by CTA, uh, CTV. It could be done by... Um, putting the catheter up high and having it reflux into the, the dural sinus if you don't, you know, you don't want to put a catheter in the dural sinus, you're right, but we should see the entire jugular vein. And from our little standpoint, we're talking about catheter being up. Right. Right. And right, right, right. Should, do we want to comment about different head positions and rotations and angulation for imaging it? In other words, and also breathing, state of breathing, uh, quiet breathing, Valsalva, hold breath, left turn, right turn. There's, those are very practical venographic questions we can probably get some comments on. That would be useful to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Should we take them one by one, yeah. or do you want to go to a different area? I mean, the majority of the lesions are going to be in the lower jugular vein, right? So we all know that. But, you know, you definitely will miss things at the, J, uh, the J3 segment if you don't study it. And you'll get tremendous blood flow coming in through the facial and uh, the pharyngeal veins that will give it a good pulse, you know, uh, propulsion down the jugular vein. And you, you have a, an outlet obstruction from the skull base. I think, we, I think it's an important part of it. Okay, yeah, fair enough. to say what those views are, but right. it seemed to me that we need at least two views or multiple views. To right, but, the, but he's bringing up a different question. I mean, you know, uh, you, do you, rotating the neck is different than obliquing the tube, and rotating the neck may be really problematic and, and identify stenosis, for which, you know, it's all muscular and really is Well, a, uh, we, we, we haven't said that a, 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 an obstruction in a rotation, because one clearly obstructs most of them, not the other, right. is an indication for treatment, but it is probably of diagnostic, it may be of diagnostic value. Maybe the group agrees that it's worth identifying or not. In other words, that's the question. Should we recommend that people obtain this information or simply look at it in angulation in a resting state and at what breathing phase. I think one other thing to get to also is the need for reproducible, consistent forms of injection by whatever it is, that, you know, that that operator studies the same way every time, not I inject this way, I inject that way. It's, we know there's so much artifactual right. filling of things. I may 
say anything, you know, the only position that I would probably avoid would be turning the head to the same side that it's being evaluated. Because that, I mean, I've seen it compresses the jugular vein pretty much to a point of occlusion. So if you want to do it in neutral position or contralateral to the vein being evaluated, it's fine. But never, I would say, never do it with the head turned to the same side that it's being evaluated. Okay, anybody else have uh, tricks or tools? Uh, maybe we, need, we should start with a minimum Yeah, no, I know. Which I think we sort of hearing things like resting, quiet breathing, neutral position, two views at least, entire jugular, and then you know, other things, and then if we need to add more. Well, I mean, we could. I would vote for that, Mike. I'd second that. Those points. Yeah. Um, I I would. I would tend to say that multiple views and leave it there. If people want to rotate the neck and fall, cause stenosis, that's up to them. I don't want to look for muscular compression, personally. Um, my second view is going to be Ivis, so I'm not going to do two views with a venogram. If you, if you accept that as an alternate view. Um, Mike, maybe you, maybe you could pose each one of those. We could take show of hands. We're trying to do our own sort of consensus or Delphi or, or Sal, however. Yeah. Yeah. Which one of those things if we can raise our hands? Okay, so every, we have a, a visualization of the entire jugular vein. Um, multiple views. Um, breathing state. Okay, so quiet breathing. One, two, three, four. Okay, uh, end expiration. Um, Valsalva. Okay, so maybe we need to leave it at, yeah, another one? But if the valve is stenosed closed, how do you how do you get that thoracic pressure above the valve? I mean, if, do you find that the vein distends in valsalva in the face of high grade stenosis? Well, you, you use IVUS too, so I know that when I use IVUS, uh, the most distension I get from the vein is end expiration and wait about 10 seconds, and that maximizes the flow in the vein, um, in, the, in the jugulars. When we get to the azagus, it's just the opposite. So we can't, I don't think we have consensus except to say that we need uh, orthogonal views. Right? <laughs> Yeah. This is minimum basic study. And Agreed. Then obviously, we expect and encourage other. You know, we, I think we, that's, that's the areas for uh, you know, research. What's the optimum way to visualize the vein, frankly? Okay. Um, leave anything out yet?
I would agree on the upper part that uh, that lateral view is really very good at looking at the the uh, cranio cervical junction. Really, the best view. I don't know. I don't know if we can. You mean that C2 compression goes away when you rotate the head? Yeah. You have some great ibis cinea showing you that. You can stick the ibis catheter up and right. uh, you don't get them to rotate. Well, well, most yeah. people don't have yeah. ibis, so. Okay. Well, that's an interesting. Uh, do we have consensus, or is that something that you guys want to write up? <laughs> See if you want them to write that up. <laughs> I mean, really, it sounds like those are things that nobody knows. But rotating the head and, and, saying, saying and changing. opening up the the J3 segment. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't. I've but, I've never noticed but that. that, I is, but, that but what that, what we do with that information doesn't matter. I mean, people don't run around with their heads like this. So if your head is in neutral position and you've got a, a very tight narrowing. Right. You know, it's, yes, it's extrinsic. Yes, it's functional, but that doesn't mean it's any significant. Right. 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 So I mean, we get into this whole. You know, I agree. I always are unfortunately in a position of defaulting to this basic. What is the basics? And then we, the next year we can add, we'll know more. Oh, I agree. Okay, so we'd leave it there? Orthogonal views? At least in neutral position. In, in neutral, at least, at least in one, in neutral position. Anybody want to add anything? Okay. Um, Two views. Okay, two views. I don't, at least minimum of uh, two views. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing that. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I say I do multiple views all the time, but I don't know if that's necessary. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, and we can't, we shouldn't be, you know, setting up a standard where you have to do it. I, you know, if you find a stenosis, is that good enough? Yeah. If you find a stenosis in atypical locations, like you do an AP view, you see a stenosis of the J2 segment. Uh, you know, they're very often that's going to do, be due to mul muscular compression, right? So in those views, should you do rotational view to confirm that it's a fixed stenosis? I can't hear. Can you speak louder? I, guess, I, can't I guess what you could do with Jerry's point is you could say to exclude disease or whatever stenosis, you must do at least two views. Now, you could be with that, right? To exclude, to exclude a stenosis, yeah. You, yeah. Right. Because obviously that allows him to have his one view. He's got a 80 percent. Why don't need another view? Other people may want to do two views for him. Right. But to exclude disease, you must have at least two views. Okay. Because in theory, they're coming to you with a diagnosis already, not basically of CCSBI. Right. So our job is to look for what might be the cause of that. So to exclude a cause in any segment, you must have two views. That's I agree. Good. We agree with that. I think we'll, to keep it simple, we need to table the question, I, uh, maybe I think we should table the question about those atypical areas of st stenosis that are physiological. We don't really have an answer, do we? I mean, I know what I do. Can other people tell me what they do? You see a J2 compression 
and you rotate the neck and the compression goes away. Or you do uh, you know, an augmented uh, of a breathing maneuver uh, like end expiration and, and then you see it distend. I mean, there are a number of techniques. We'll leave that alone. That's too complicated at this moment. Would you agree? Exactly. Um, I, think that I, I agree, Sal, because I think there's such a, a variation in what that is from I mean, a 90% to a 99% to a 50%. Yes. Yeah. I think we don't know. We don't know enough, right. OK. Um, now let's go to the azagus. What's the two do, views? Do we want to talk about the injection yeah. techniques? For example, I like you would use a long sheath. I inject with a long sheath in the lower half. I inject with a catheter at a sort of fixed, consistent injection at the higher part. I'm not saying that's a recommended technique, but I'm sure we'll get a lot of different versions. Do we want to talk about you know, okay. how to do the injections a bit? Because, for example, your document talks about power versus hand, things like that. Let's and we know we can overfill things. So you want to stay with the jugular vein? Well, just okay. I think this is a, okay, something fine. to comment fine, fine. on. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I think that's that's a very good comment, and we could then other things such as IVUS, pressure gradients. Uh, well, we'll get to that. You know, maneuvers of inspiration. We could say we expect. Augmentation of the basic exam by dot, 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 may be of value in further assessing, but we're not saying what its utility is, what it isn't. Right. But that's different than the actual injection. <coughs> Steve's point, you know. So right. and, and, and in that sense, I, I, I you know, my proposal is, is to use a, a power injector because it's the, the, the thing that can be reproducible. If you use a power injector and, and you quantify the pressure, flow rates, amount of cultures that you're going to use, you state it that way, then it's reproducible. I mean, because hand injections, I mean, you probably inject harder than I do, or I, I don't know, it's, it's, it, that's not reproducible. But what, what's the, what are we trying to accomplish? Stop. We want to visualize the vessel with some contrast that's not going to be too opaque. We're, we're, we're trying to, to we're trying to get our arms around the fact that venography is a black art compared to art to compared to arteriography, where it's much easier to get a consistent picture of an artery. And here we can make a lot of collaterals in some people or miss them by, you know, not filling the upper jugular vein or otherwise. So um, I think some general recommendations to create awareness about the fact that artifactually excessive injections can overfill things beyond what may be a physiologic reality. The need for an individual operator to consistently perform this for themselves as we learn something as a group as to whether there are ways that we recommend, at least individuals should aim to have consistent injections that try to mimic physiologic flow that is not over inject. We don't have to be more specific if we cannot reach consensus. That would be my suggestion for the group to consider. Mike? The other thing we need to talk about is contrast and dilution of contrast. So let's put that to the side. Right. But I mean, obviously, people are somewhat comfortable with hand injection because it allows you to customize to what the flow is. And if we pick a, a machine injection, we like the reproducibility. But again, with the vein being so different compliance between individuals, it's hard to make a standard of what we should inject. Again, you inject, you see what it is. If you want to then pick what you're going to machine inject for the rest of that time you're in that vein, that's one thing, but it's, I think it'd be hard to pick, you know, just arbitrarily a number for, a, a, for a differences in compliance between individuals and not. Right. The other limitation is what you see is highly dependent on catheter position as well. I mean, if you're from just below the facial vein, just above it, I mean, it's, it's, stenography is going to be very hard to have a gold standard reproducible. Yeah. Well, I guess the first question is, I mean, Hector said, let's have a show of hands. Should, should we advocate, advocate, not necessarily mandate, advocate power injection? We have a show of hands on that? And who doesn't think we need to do that? Okay. So let's, instead of 
getting that detail, why can't we talk but about... No, wait, let me I'm finish. sorry to interrupt, but we can comment that the group could not reach consensus on whether it should be hand injection or power injection. I think that's, that's what we took. It was almost 50-50. Was it? I thought it was like three or four to about eight or nine. Let's ask it again. Yeah, okay. So power injection. One, two, three. Hand injection. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Marion, which one? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, if you look at the document, it's already discussed here, all this pro and contrast. It's point two. But Marion, we haven't had that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, so you, you but but wait, uh, wait, uh, our discussion is also a result of discussion. It's not my document. It's uh, it was created by at least 10 years. Okay, so, so the question then becomes not about how we do it, but what's the end point of what we do? Do we want to see uh, reflux above the tip of the catheter? Do we want to see filling of collaterals? What is it that we want to see? Any, have, have anybody, Marianne, what, what did your, uh, your previous group come up with that answer? What is the goal, the end point of the venogram that makes it an adequate venogram? So primary, uh, our team looks for normal outflow or abnormal outflow. So we are looking mostly at, at the flow, no? not at the anatomy by itself. Of course, there are some, some, some cases where anatomy is, is crucial, but in most of the cases, it is a functional problem. Okay, and we're not going to get, you know, any other ideas? You know, my, my idea is, and I, and I haven't proven this yet, but I think it's provable, is that uh, opacification of the dural sinuses and visualization of the condylar emissary vein is really uh, an important criteria <laughs> for some of the things. But we're not, we're not there yet, you know. But I don't know. I don't think we can come to consensus on this either, except I would say that we, you have to see the entire jugular vein. And that's all. You don't have to see collaterals, correct? Is that agreed? Because you'd have to inject by power to do that. Okay, let's talk about that. Um, uh, let's just uh, have a show of hands because I, uh, who believes that, uh, that we should dilute it to some degree? Who thinks it should be full strength? Okay, so um, we didn't get consensus there. I mean, not many people answered. Um, I have trouble with the full strength contrast because it obscures the valves very difficult to see the valves if it's completely opaque, especially when it refluxes past the valve and then, re, you know, regurgitates up. Let's see, what, what is the advantage of full strength? Okay. What is the advantage? Why do you use full strength contrast? I usually inject with an injector. Okay. Okay. But a lot of we we would we would all agree that the I think the majority of um, the venous abnormalities are intraluminal, webs, septations, immobile valves. Those are the pathological findings. And are you able to see them at full strength contrast, or is it so dense that you can't see them? Yeah. Okay. Any any other comments? Can you speak louder? I can't. I'm sorry. The document that you handed out says non diluted contrast allows better opacification of epidural and other collaterals as well as better estimation of overall features of veins, particularly stenosis. I'm just answering the question. Oh, but you said, but I when we had a show of hands, you said you believed in using full strength. But that's that's we don't that's not our consensus. I understand this document when you hand it out, you ask the question, what is the reason for non diluted Oh, I, I, that's not your answer. I, I agree with you. You agree with it, okay. <laughs> so there's no consensus. No consensus. Okay. Um, 
Anything else uh, on the jugular vein? Mm -hmm. We talk about the abnormalities themselves. What constitutes an abnormality uh, to perform angioplasty? Sal, I'd, I'd ask the question, what is the standard way we should try to measure stenosis, right? Because so what is an abnormality? Oh, we want to go down treated, to, right? okay, you want to go measuring stenosis first. You know, we, we talk about it for carotids, you know, with NASA criteria and so forth. You know, is there a way that we can sort of come up with some kind of, you know, criteria for how to, how to measure a stenosis consistently? Anybody? I mean, I mean, you know, have a standard way of measuring. You should you should measure it against the ipsilateral jugular vein. And the question is, what part of the jugular vein would you measure the stenosis against? So we would agree we would agree that you would do it to the ipsilateral jugular vein. Now the question is, what part of the jugular vein? The part above, just above it, in uh, the stenosis. The part below it. I guess. Most of my work is Ivan's. Right. Just yeah, but it's all Mike, we're, out, we're outliers, so let's, you know, we, we, we don't want to bring Ivis to the general group here because half of them are not using Ivis at all, right. or more than half. So, Mike, any advice? What would you, how would you make a measurement? Would I you? You're using IVIS. IVIS, yeah. Okay. And anybody who doesn't use IVIS have a, have a comment here? We, we have, you know, we, we know that we know that in our survey people are using as little as 25% uh, stenosis. And we know that stenosis got its own problems because it's not ideal. But we have to come up with something. It's going to be very. You know, you're going to have to. Right. You're never going to make it look like the check of the vein in the, the mid neck, and you're going to run into trouble ballooning if you're trying to balloon that bit. Which, you know, which leads, my, it leads Mike and I to advocate for the use of IVIS for all of this stuff, but I don't want to bring that up now. It's, 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 it's not enough people. Doesn't this follow under Jerry's approach, which is if you have a stenosis, do you need to get a second view? In other words, IVIS is a tool that we, I mean, I'm trying to find the middle, which we would suggest when you don't see a stenosis otherwise. No, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about we see a stenosis, and now we want to measure the stenosis. Is it, do you measure it against the dilated segment just above it? Do you, you know, exactly how far above the stenosis? In other words, without IVIS whatsoever. Without IVIS. Okay, all right. We think IVIS, Mike and I think that IVIS is the right way to do this, but we're going to leave that out because we're, we're in the minority. So we're looking for, uh, if we're going to say 25% stenosis is acceptable, and I'm not saying we are, then we have to make a measurement by some standardization. So what, what should we use? What part of the vein do you want to measure by? Oh my God. Does, anybody measure the, does anybody measure the stenosis at all? Jerry, what do you, how do you do it? Right, right. Better way. Right. I'm open. Well, I think IVIS 
It is called the jugular bulb. The, the jugular bulb is what gets, you know, the, the inferior jugular bulb is what gets stenosed. So it's, you know, you can't use the J3 segment uh, to make that measurement, you know, I mean. So, so, so can we? No, we don't want to use IBIS. So you don't, you don't want to? We don't want to talk about IBIS. It's a, it's a, uh, no, no, we're in, the, we're in a cath lab. OK, so, so let's. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 I think I knew what you mean to deal with that. But I just, back to what, what is a stenosis? Forget what we're measuring. But what percentage do we consider to be low significance? That must be in the literature somewhere. No, I don't think it's in the literature. For veins? So, how, so we just arbitrarily are picking some percentage based on what we think to be a relatively adjacent normal appearance of okay. a normal vein. But how do we pick 25, 50, 70 on the basis of what, though? I think we, we need to have, uh, you know, that's where we need fluid dynamics uh, input. Well, that's what I mean. So I think we're, we run close. We're in jeopardy of starting to throw out some number. And someone said, why'd you pick 25? Why'd you pick 50? I mean, we don't know. So that makes it very difficult then to go to the next step of finding what a stenosis is. Well, one of the things that we could do is show some venograms in an audience like this one and say, hey, this venogram number one, what do you think? Where would, what would you use as a reference? And then, because right now we're trying to remember how the venograms look and what do you use as a reference. But if you look at it in a picture, then and you show it to all of us, then you say, okay, where do you think it should be done? And calculate the, the percentage of stenosis. That's a proposal. It's probably a 10 or 15 minute deal. But I mean, we can probably come to a better understanding. But it wouldn't right be based now. on, it wouldn't be based on any evidence. That's the problem. I think we have to say that we have no consensus on this, that we don't even know what significant stenosis is. I would echo that. I, having some conversations with the, the fluid dynamics guys, I mean, I, I did a little calculation. If you look at cross-sectional area related to radius, right, which is pi r squared, so a 25% radius reduction is greater than a 50% cross-sectional area reduction. I mean, that's right. pretty significant. It yeah. flows related to cross-sectional area. But when I was talking to the fluid dynamics people, they told me that in actually in fluid dynamics, it's R to the fourth. Right. So now when you look at that and say I have a 25% reduction in radius, that's a really significant decrease in flow, right? So it's, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. We have no consensus on this. I don't know. But I, I think the number's going to be lower than what we would think it's going to I, be in the 20% range. Under 20, right. But I think maybe what we, should, what we need to say is that there is no foundation for consensus for measurements and that the, the, the justification for picking a percent stenosis is uh, not, not determined at this point and that we need further uh, recommendations from uh, experts in fluid dynamics. Does that sound reasonable? So we're just making up numbers here. Right? Yeah. I think that we have to change our mind in this field of medicine because now we treat veins, not artery. So I think it's not a matter of stenosis in this disease, but it's a matter of lesions. So um, before you were speaking about uh, annulus, I think that the goal when you, you find an annulus is to break the annulus. Because if you break the andalus, patients feel much better. So I think if you put a bigger balloon, a very big balloon, you break the andalus. The problem is sometimes you can cause some damages in the wall vessel. Because the andalus can be very resistant. Sometimes it breaks and you feel the noise. You feel a real noise when the andalus breaks. And patients go very well when you feel the noise. Because they can tell you, OK, I feel my hand. But sometimes the andalus can be very resistant. So you put a big balloon, you, you, you break the andalus, but you cause a damage 
in the in the world. So we went, we have to see in the future if that patient will develop some problems in the world. That's the problem. And when you have, for instance, a membrane, you have to break the membrane because the membrane can be fixed. You, you, you break the membrane and you see that at the Doppler ultrasound, because I do the Doppler ultrasound during, before and after the procedure, and you see that the flow is much better, but the same problem. To open the two membranes, maybe you have to, co you have to balloon a lot and you, co you can cause a, a problem in the, in the wall. That's, that's the, in my opinion, the goal is to get rid of the lesions. Okay. I mean, it's true, but I'm, now I'm totally lost here, but I don't think we can, this was exactly what I thought would happen, that we would come in here and not be able to come up with consensus. Because most of this stuff is totally new. Uh, Steve, you, you've, you've spent a lot of time around veins. Anything that you have to add about stenoses of veins and you know low pressure stenoses? I, I I think everybody hit all these points when we think about, for example, veins in dialysis. For years we had simply arbitrarily picked up 50% because that was the coronary of the arterial literature, and that was nicely shown years later as well maybe it should be 30% or maybe it should be flow actually, and we could discard that binary stenosis at 50%. So we're talking about the same things here just earlier on in the literature, that an arbitrary stenosis in a mid-vein versus an annulus is a different thing, and we don't know what those thresholds are. And you know, you're treating somebody with re-stenosis, the thresholds may be very different as well. Right. Um, I, I, I'm wondering what the document that we're trying to produce might look like, and maybe, you know, thinking very concretely, that might help continue to guide us. Maybe if, if our goal is to say, you know, we took 10 questions by the group, and this is where, and, you know, question number one, should this, we reach consensus, we recommend number two, we could not, more study this, number three, and then, you know, that's a road map for people reading it and also for coming back to revise it, and that form may be better than, uh, a narrative form. I agree. So maybe we just, let's just keep hitting sort of the points and trying to reach them and then you can transcribe. I think there's, there's going to have to be some rich statement that's kind of the odd that this time our current understanding of the locations and etiologies of jugular vein pathology and CCSVI does not allow us to precisely define uh, well, whatever it is we're having trouble with, you know. Right. That this present time, we do have consensus on these things as, right. as completely sort of embarrassing and primitive as it is, you got to start somewhere. I agree. That's, that's what this is for. I think that being able to make up an arbitrary decision right now about what we will call a measurement of stenosis would be useful for going forward. So at least we could have some consensus about how to measure stenosis. We may not be, we may not, that may not be accurate, but at least it's a framework for beginning so that we could go back and then, you know, look at the outcomes of things like 20% stenosis or, you know, what percentage of the patients have 20% stenosis? You know, most of them seem to have 90% stenosis anyhow, 50 to 90%. So, so we're not... We don't have to talk about the threshold for intervention. No. We simply have to describe um, specific places at which we suggest it be measured. Right, that's and all. tools for measuring. That so would be fine. I think if we said the minimum, the minimum diameter Within would be the stenosis. Within one centimeter of the narrowing with the, with the vein, with the large, let me throw something out for the group. The narrowest point compared to the largest diameter of the vein within one to two centimeters. Two Let's centimeters. agree on a number like that so that it's a local comparison. I, so I could agree with that. This is something that is done in other veins when we use a reference vein and a stenosis. So we say within two centimeters away, you're narrowing compared to the largest diameter within two centimeters away. We're all going to measure in that zone. Is that? Is that I think it gives us a framework for starting discussions and at least having some more uh, consent. Well, you know. is there comments from the group or yeah. should we vary that or? Anybody have an alternative? Yeah. Well, I guess, can you hear me or do you want me? 
louder. Yeah, I can't. I'm deaf. We are talking about always stenosis and uh, to measure it. I mean, whether we, we need or not to, to be exactly specific about the percentage of stenosis, I don't know. Uh, but I think that one of the main goals could be also to, to see the result of the, the angioplasty. For example, sometimes you can see that probably the, the, the treat that, the, 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 the piece of the jugular vein that you treat, the stenosis, um, if you do a control after, a phlebography of control, uh, you can see that that, 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 mm, that piece of jugular vein has not changed in diameter, but you can see that the, all the shunts disappear. And then, I mean, that could be a measure of the outcome of the angioplasty as well. I mean, if you don't see any more all the alternative circles. No, but that's, a, that's a different question. Let's, just, let's, get, let's get something finished first. Then we can uh, talk about that. I just want to okay. know, anybody have an alternate proposal for how we measure a stenosis? So arbitrarily, we could say that we advise that measurement of a stenosis be done in the following way for consistency in the literature. Does that sound like a reasonable approach? We're not telling how to, whether to treat a 20 or 50 or 90 percent stenosis. We're not talking about the follow-up for the moment. Can we do that? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I, I think it's we're, if anything, we need to err on, we don't know what a 20 percent stenosis we, might be or a 10 percent stenosis. Well, we can, so we, just dismiss it as insignificant, you just kind of can't do that. No, but I'm saying at least we could, somebody might come up and prove to us that that's not an accurate measurement, but we're just doing an arbitrary measurement so that we could recommend how people define a percent stenosis when they report cases. That's all. So, Sal, let me just add one caveat to that. Should we say within two centimeters of a non tapering segment of the vein? For instance, you know how sometimes the vein will look very yes. funnel shaped and it, it really hasn't ballooned to, you know, you know what I'm saying? With, Right. That, that was my concern. And the other thing is, are we going to say it's, we're measuring the normal area proximal to the area of the stenosis, or it doesn't really matter. It can be distal or proximal. You know, so if it's a, a mid-segment, J2 segment, are you going to measure in J3, or are you going to measure in J1? You know what I mean? I'm just throwing it out there to, to get some idea, because there, there could be a little bit of... I think it's got to be... Um Cephalad to the, I think we, we'll just define it. It's an arbitrary definition that we're creating, that's all. So two centimeters cephalad to the, the most narrowed segment. And if it's in a big funnel, that's life. That's what it is, that's all. I mean, I mean we can't, if you, when you start saying where it stops tapering, I think we'll be, we'll never be able to make that clear. Well, you know, if, if we go back to the carotid, they don't tell you, you know, always measure two centimeters above. You know, it, it's in the normal segment, right, above. So it, it, that's why I think we're having, a, I'm having a little bit of heartburn with right. just saying two centimeters. Well, it's, it's a vein, it's different, you know. I mean, we gotta pick something, let's do it. Unless somebody comes up with another proposal, we're talking about measuring a stenosis against a narrowing uh, divided by uh, the, the maximum dimension within two centimeters of the stenosis. No, I don't think we have enough evidence. To no, it's not evidence. It's arbitrary. Three centimeters. I'll vote for three. We don't agree on any reproducible means to measure a percent stenosis on the number. It's an arbitrary number that we're just defining. That's all. You want to make it three? I don't care. It doesn't matter. You could say, the, you know, the sigmoid sinus for all I care. I just say we have to have some standard that, that we measure the same thing among, among, uh, among ourselves. That's all. There's no evidence base. There's nothing to base evidence on. But we're not. We're not, we're not saying to treat anything. We're just saying we, this is how we recommend making a measurement. 
We're, talk, we're talking about reporting standards. Yeah. Okay, we're talking about reporting standards. You want to write a paper, you want to put an IRB protocol, and you have to say what your endpoints are. So we're just trying to get around whether we can even agree on an endpoint that may fall so that in the next six or seven months, independent of the annulus or rupturing or something like that, that perhaps we'll see posters that will have at least these things that can be therefore invalidated or validated a year from now. So I mean, it's no more than that. It's not binding as to treat. Did the SIR document talk about? Talked about 50% stenosis. Yeah, which was as yeah, but you that's know, challenging as this, and of course, and it didn't actually talk about reference vein diameter, which is, I mean, honestly, I struggle a lot with this in the dialysis study that I'm running now, and now that we're getting all these information back from centers, we have a lot of trouble sort of, if that vein is abnormally enlarged, then you could actually get a negative percent stenosis in some patients. And, you know, so this is, I mean, there's a, this is a morass, but we got, you got to have something. And, you know, if it's three centimeters is good, then it's fine. If everybody measures within three centimeters in the year from now, we come back, we have 700 measurements that say that this is great or nonsense. We're, we're five steps ahead. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd say Fisher cut bait with something around there, and we can still talk about, you know, fixed and annuals, so, et cetera. So, Jerry, you like three centimeters? I don't care. Do we have agreement on three centimeters? Maximum, proximal, or just? Central, uh, uh, cephalad. Those are rare. Well, I know, but we got to have something. Well, you know, you know. Maybe rare, but we got to have a way to deal with it. I mean, to, that's to, not to, the jugular to, vein, anyhow. But no, but let's expand on Mike's point. We have a mid jugular stenosis, and the vein at the base of the jugular is its natural, substantially larger size. That mid jugular stenosis may not be far from the normal smaller vein caliber there. That's right. So we do have to have. some recognition of uh, what, what's normal getting smaller as we move higher. I think the definition will vary on which segment of the jugular vein you're talking about. Okay. That's why two centimeters is probably more accurate, you know. Right. Well, of, of, of adjacent normal appearing vein adjacent within, normal. Within, within X centimeters. Within three, within three centimeters. Okay. Okay. So that would work. In the upper segment, adjacent would be on either side. If you're down at the, at the valve, you really can't measure below the valve really, most of the time, anyhow. So it's adjacent or no, distal? <laughs> no, no, we're not using the word distal here. Forget it. Yeah, but down is the SVC. There is no jugular there, so down is not. <laughs> We're going to say adjacent, so that leaves either side. Adjacent jugular vein. Well, you can't do that in the central part of the jugular vein because there isn't any. Operators who report this data have to report where the reference vein was. Okay, that that's part of saying this. When you say two centimeters, you have to report where you measured it. So if everybody's going to measure mid jugular and then claim that they measured against C2, then you know race ipso loquitur. So you just have to record your, you know, the, the adjacent site, where that was, and then the facts speak for themselves. Clarity? Okay. That's, imagine we can't, not getting very, very far on this at all. Well, no, no, let's, I mean, let me, let me try to summarize what we've said, because these are all, you know, critical day-to-day -day points for people in veins, right? So, uh, percent stenosis compared to um, reference vein, largest reference vein diameter within three centimeters, the site of the reference vein will be described. Right, right. Okay. Does that do it? But can we take a show of hands on that? Yeah. Against? No. Sleep? 
Everybody's going to see it when you circulate it, and there'll be comments or time for comments. Right? Okay. Um, we have time for anything else?